Have you ever used someone else's credit card before? Good, because that is illegal. You know, as God's children, we have a spiritual credit card. But it's not in our name. It doesn't have a credit limit. There's no interest. In fact, there's no statements at the end of the month demanding our payment. Just God's grace at His expense. Our passage this morning in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount calls us to live in response to God's grace. Keep watching. We'll be taking a look at Matthew chapter 7. Welcome to St. Peter's Church. This is our Sunday stream. If this is your very first time watching, thanks for letting us into your home or wherever you might be watching from. My name is Grant and we as a church would love to hear from you. We'd also love to say hi back. And there's a great way that you can do that. Click on the say hi link in the comment section below this video and we'll say hi back to you. It's always great to hear from those new to our online streams. And maybe when this lockdown is over, we can even meet in person. Imagine that. It's great news though that whatever the present situation, no matter how uncertain or dark the future might look, God is for us, His children. And when we doubt that, all we need to do is look back in history and see what He has done. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? It's so clear to see God's love for us when we look back at what he has already given up for us. His one and only son. God is certainly for us.
back in the olden days, like three months ago, around this time in service, it would normally be when the kids got up gracefully and quietly and went off to kids' church. Now, parents have the joy and privilege to do kids' church with their kids at home. We are wanting to help and support you as parents through this and have created kids' videos, which are really for the whole family. There are three steps for these videos. Watch the video, answer the questions as a family, and then pray together. We are currently going through a series by Faith and Kids specifically written for this lockdown period called We Need Jesus. The amazing thing with this material is that the full lesson plan is available and it has more questions for younger and older kids and fun activities for the whole family. I asked some families some questions about how it's going and this is what they said. Homeschooling, spending time with my family and playing and loving them. Doing a dinner party with my mom. Seeing my friend Anne. School. Church services. Easter story. My favorite church service was Jesus walking on water. Now with the stream, uh, we found that we've got to get up a bit earlier, uh, but it's also quite a bit easier because it doesn't matter if we rock up to church in our jammies, make a cup of coffee or tea just before the service starts. Now with doing it online, it's really afforded us the opportunity as a family to chat about what they've learned and how it applies to us as a family and them as individuals. So that's been really encouraging. I love watching Caitlin on the videos. Hi everyone. So, yeah, lockdown drags on and yet also kind of loosens up a bit. School's kind of easing back, business, business is trying to get back to normal. Just around town you notice how the, the traffic is picking up on the roads. And yet restrictions on large public gatherings still very much apply. And with a congregation of our size and while the spread of the virus continues to accelerate gatherings of, of uh, 50 on a Sunday do not yet seem feasible or, or wise. Certainly in our recent congregational survey the vast majority of people expressed the, the desire just to hold off for the time being. But we will keep on assessing things and will keep you posted with any changes. Please do keep on praying. Pray that in the not too distant future we'll be able to get back together Perhaps pray especially that small gatherings at homes, such as small group Bible studies, would be permitted soon. Uh, and then please keep on accessing everything online and then sharing it with others. And in the meantime, there's actually a special opportunity to do that, to, to share things with others. Uh, the past four months have raised so many issues for Christians and for our society. A lot of new questions have been raised about life in this world. A lot of old questions about God and eternity seem to be more pertinent now than ever before. Uh, in that congregational survey uh, we did a few weeks ago, we, we noticed that so many people have got big questions about the afterlife, for example. And, and the issues at the moment are not just around COVID-19. Across the world we've seen protests against racial discrimination, uh, we've seen how that is causing people to reassess their views on how we can heal division, how we record history, how we engage in civil protest. And so in the midst of all of this change, all of this anxiety and confusion, does the Bible really have anything to say? Because many people just dismiss it as an ancient text for ancient cultures. But our conviction is that when it's carefully studied and applied, God will use His Word to guide us through difficult times. He promises to bring clarity to our minds, purpose to our lives, and order in the midst of chaos. We read in Psalm 119 verse 105, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So, our upcoming sermon series starting in a few weeks' time is aimed at answering some of the big questions of the season we're in. And because through lockdown we've been choosing just about everything online, now there's a chance to choose your sermon series kind of from a takeaway menu. Step one is this. Uh, we've got a menu of 30 topics to choose from. You can find the menu on our website, stpetersfisher.org.za forward slash 
order in. Uh, that link will also be sent out via email and WhatsApp. You'll also be able to find the link in the description of this video on our homepage and on our Facebook and Instagram sites. Choose five questions from that list which you would like answered. Uh, you'll find on, the on that list questions like, um, if God is in control, why is this world so messed up? Uh, should you obey authorities when you disagree with them? How should Christians respond to Black Lives Matter? Uh, what is a Christian view of ecology and the environment? How can I speak to kids about death and the afterlife? What might church look like after COVID-19? Long list of those types of questions. Choose five of them. And then step two, share the menu with friends and family members, with colleagues, share it on social media, wherever. Just forward the link which we send to you. We'll then gather up all of your responses and use them to come up with a teaching series that hopefully covers all of them. Uh, some will be in the form of sermons, some uh, will be Zoom panel discussions, some will be short midweek slots. It'll all happen from the 19th of July to the 9th of August. That's in just a few weeks time. We really look forward to getting all your responses and stay in touch with our website and with social media for all the updates. It's incredible that no matter how hard we try, we can never outgive God. Jesus said, but seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. And then he added, do not be afraid little flock for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. That's Luke chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Then Jesus says in John 3, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God is so generous. Not only is he pleased to give us his kingdom, but he has also given up the king of that kingdom for us. Good news like that must be spread and your financial giving enables that good news to go out into Fishuk and further away as we support our missionary partners. As you give this morning or wherever or whenever you do that, remember that we do it following our generous Father. Please do make use of the details which will come up on the screen. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. That's Proverbs 28 verse 13. Confession is less of a one-time event in the lives of God's children and more of a daily attitude. It's the humble walk of all those who trust Jesus. It's not out of guilt or an attempt to twist God's arm but acknowledgement that we have fallen far short of God's standard and our right standing with God is based on our relationship with Him through Jesus and not our religious performance. There's going to be an opportunity to pray together now and confess our sin before God. But before we pray together, let's take a quiet moment to reflect on God's love despite our many sins. Let's pray these words together on the screen. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we confess that we can go days without recognizing your grace in our lives. Failing to acknowledge all we have comes from you. We are slow to humble ourselves and seek your gracious provision. At times we would rather rely on our own strength than your generosity. We fall so far short of your perfect son, Jesus, who always humbly trusted you. Please forgive our sin of pride and unbelief. We rely wholly on the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. 
Help us to trust you wholeheartedly. Give us praying hearts willing to ask, seek and knock in dependence on you. Give us grace to walk in your light. Strengthen us with your spirit so our light shines, causing others to praise you. Do this all for your glory. Amen. The words of this next song beautifully and simply express the result of Jesus' death in our place. The chorus goes, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the great I am, our God in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Father, as we dig into your word, we pray for humility, for meekness, and for wisdom, and how we relate to others, both Christians and non-Christians. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us how to pray. Lord, may we ask to hear from you. May we seek so we can find answers in you. May we knock so that you will open the door for us. And Father, through it all, may we treat others as we would want them to treat us. God, we pray for each member of our church family that they would be known for their, for their love of others. And we pray specifically for the mercy ministries of St. Peter's, that you would open doors for the body of believers to be a shining light here in the valley and beyond. We also pray for Ubabalo and Timba Church and Pastor Becky and the believers in Masi who share your word and your love daily. Guide them, lead them, and give them open doors to proclaim your name now more than ever. Lord, we also pray for wisdom for the leaders of South Africa, for the leaders of churches throughout the country, and specifically for the leaders of St. Peter's. May you guide and lead each of them to know how best to respond in love to the hurting, the hurting and broken world around them. We trust you, Lord, and are continually amazed by your promises, your grace, and your mercy to all of us. Thank you, Lord, that you, may, that you are in control of all things. Increase and deepen our faith, O oh God. May we constantly remind ourselves that even though we are more sinful than we realize, we are more loved and forgiven than we dare dream through Christ our Savior. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good gifts to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. This is the word of God. Hi everyone, I'm Carl Pino, one of the pastors at St. Peter's Church. It's a joy to share God's word with you from Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 12. But let's turn to our Father in prayer and ask him to help us understand his word. Father God, thank you so much for the grace of being able to connect in this way on St. Peter's stream, that we can continue our sermon series in Matthew's gospel and listen to Jesus. But we want to come to you, ask you, seek your face, knock on your door. And ask, Father, please give us grace and understanding to understand and comprehend what we're going to learn now from your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when I started following Jesus, I had no idea what I was doing, how I was supposed to live. It was all new to me. I had some idea I started reading at least my Bible regularly, but I didn't know how to work it out in my day-to-day -day life. And as a young Christian, I looked for a role model, someone who has been walking with Jesus longer than me and could help me. And maybe you feel the same. You know something about Jesus. You've been reading your Bible. You've been even coming to St. Peter's stream. You believe in him. You want to follow him. But where to start? We need help. And sadly for me, it was a couple of years before I met a Christian who pointed me in the right direction. And when I look back on my early Christian walk, the one thing I regret is not meeting that Christian sooner. Someone who was honest about being a beggar as well, as broken as I am, but who could point me to where to find bread. Even so, I'm glad I finally met this person who basically did what Jesus is doing in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 12. He pointed me to the goodness of the Father revealed in Jesus. 
And if we look at the context, you will hopefully see why I'm glad this person did it for me. If you have been listening to Jesus' words in chapters 5 to 6, you might feel incredibly intimidated by Jesus' standard. I mean, if you just reread it and revisit it, we are supposed to be people who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers. We're supposed to be people marked by reconciliation, not grudges, purity, not lust, loyalty and honesty, not oath-breaking, loving to all, not selective in whom we love. We're supposed to be authentic, not pretending, forgiving, not vengeful, focused on Jesus' kingdom, not our own. And like we learned last week, not condemning, but honest about ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never seen any Christian live up to the standard always. And I would be a hypocrite if I claimed to live up to the standard. I mean, I've seen glimmers of this in myself and other Christians, no denying that, but it's often overshadowed covered up or obscured by the clouds of sin. We all have planks in our eyes, as we learned last week. So where do we turn to for help? Who do we look to? And as Christians, to whom should we point others to as an example? It is here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 12, that Jesus points us to where we need to turn to, where we can find our daily bread Now, throughout chapters 5 to 6, Jesus has been hinting at it. Really, don't look at yourself or the hypocrites who claim to have it all together, but look towards, as Jesus points out in verses 7 to 11, your heavenly Father. And he starts off by saying, ask him for help by turning to him in prayer. Verses 7 to 8. Listen to what he says in verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Notice, Jesus commands us, his followers, to ask, seek, knock. Now, all three commands are basically saying the same thing, but from different angles, different pictures. Like a child going to his parents, wanting something we should ask. Like a student going to a teacher, wanting to know we should seek. Like a guest wanting to come in, we should knock. There's nothing in this life in which we are not dependent upon our Heavenly Father. We should always turn to Him in prayer, asking, seeking, knocking. And we see this in the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. I mean, listen to how we should pray. Give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. We need Him. Yet what is more remarkable is not the commands, but the promises in verse 8, or the promise. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. To the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Notice, at no point will the Father not answer us. We will, he says, receive, find, be open to. We shouldn't doubt whether the Father will not answer us or will answer us. In fact, we should expect that He will answer us. And according to Jesus, there is no such thing, no such thing as unanswered prayer. Now, maybe at this point I need to interject just to clarify something. It's true. There's no such thing as unanswered prayer. But that does not mean we will get what the answer we always want. Because like any good parent, God the Father will answer in our best interest. Even if the answer might imply going through pain. I mean, for example, my, my children are generally terrified of needles and injections. The idea of going to the dentist or the clinic is not something they look forward to. And honestly, I don't like going either. But I know it is necessary. I know it's good. And so I don't always answer in the way my children would like when they ask me not to go. They might even accuse me of being unloving. 
But I know the most loving thing to do is to take them to the clinic or the dentist. And personally, when I look back on my life, I'm incredibly grateful that God the Father hasn't always answered the way I prayed. I wouldn't be here, actually, if he did. And when I look back, his answers has always been the best. And even when we don't know why God answered in the way he did, when we can't even see by looking back, when we feel conflicted by his answer, we should always remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed this, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. It not as I will, but as you will. That's Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Jesus dreaded the suffering that the cross would entail, the cup of judgment he would drink in our place. And he was honest, but he was willing to submit to the Father's answer. It was by drinking the cup of judgment on the cross that God the Father orchestrated the greatest good, the forgiveness of sins, triumph over death, and the hope of eternal life with him. And so we should take confidence there that even when we don't understand the answer, it's good for us. But Jesus continues, yes, turn to your heavenly Father in prayer, but also see, look at verses 9 to 11, his example. Now in verses 9 to 10, Jesus demonstrates that biological parents, biological fathers who are tainted by sin, generally give good things to their children or for their children. Or which one of you, he says, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Even though our hearts are evil, as Jesus says, tainted and twisted by sin, rebellion against God, we at least know, he says, how to give good gifts to your children. Generally, as biological parents, we try to do our best for our children. Yet in a supreme way, our Heavenly Father is perfect in goodness and a perfect example of doing good for His children. See what He says in verse 11. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? He is the perfect example of giving or doing something for the benefit of His children. The Apostle James, when he reflects on this in James chapter 1, verse 17, puts it this way. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. There is no catch or bait or switch in what our heavenly Father gives us. His reasons are always pure and good. And if you doubt his goodness, maybe, or his sincerity in what he's given, just read Matthew's Gospel. The Gospel is about the greatest gift he could give us, his Son, Jesus, who, as Matthew starts, will save his people from their sins. Chapter 1, verse 21. In whom God will always be with us. In whom we receive, as Jesus says, at the cross, close to the cross, the forgiveness of sins. The Son who will bring us into God the Father's kingdom now and forever. Yes, this gift that we learn about in Matthew's gospel implies something painful about us. The reason the Father gifted us with his Son was because we were captives to sin, burdened with a debt of sin we cannot repay, exiles from God's kingdom, doomed to eternal death. Yet, there is no greater gift the Father could have given us. A gift we all desperately need, and it's for eternal good. <laughs> this is the type of father we have as followers in Jesus. A perfect father who does perfectly good for his children because he loves them. So turn to him in prayer. He has demonstrated his goodness in more ways than you know. Every single day and ultimately in Jesus. Yet why would Jesus point to the Father's goodness at this point? Now apart from motivating us to pray to the Father, depending on Him for everything, trusting Him that He is good, He also wants us to follow His Father as our role model, 
our example. And in verse 12, Jesus concludes by showing us the way of the Father. Now, although verse 12 is often called the golden rule, it's actually linked with what we have been just looking at by the word so or therefore. See what Jesus says. So, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Notice, Jesus' words are proactive. They're not passive, avoiding something or just not doing something, or reactive, only doing something when someone else has done something. No, we should actively do what we would like others do for us. It is actually a summary of everything we've looked at since chapter 5. Rather than experiencing someone's anger or hate, we all would like someone to reconcile with us in love. Instead of being unfaithful and dishonest, we would all like someone to be loyal and honest in love. We all want someone to love us even when we seem unlovable. We all want forgiveness instead of someone holding a grudge. We all want mercy and grace instead of someone's condemnation and judgment. Really, what Jesus has been unpacking this whole time is one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. To be other-centered, serving and finding your joy in others, rather than self-centered, only looking out for number one, yourself. And here's the thing. There has only been one being who has demonstrated this type of love for us. Only one role model who has lived up to this standard. Jesus has been pointing to him the whole time. God the Father. It is his example we are called to imitate. Jesus has already called us to do it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And specifically, the Father showed his other-centered way perfectly in the gift of his Son, Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of the command, love your neighbor as yourself, or whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. You see the heart of the Father in the life of Jesus. The whole gospel shows it. In fact, I would encourage you, just go read chapter 8, the next chapter. And this is what you will see. Instead of turning away from a leper in revulsion, Jesus willingly cleanses the man. Instead of despising the Roman centurion, Jesus heals the man's servant. Instead of leaving people in the captivity of demon possession, Jesus liberates them. Time and time again, Jesus shows us the Father's heart, doing to others what you would like them to do to you. And ultimately, Jesus would demonstrate the Father's heart by forgiving our debt of sin, absorbing that debt by dying on the cross on our behalf. Jesus paid the wages of sin so that we might receive the gift of eternal life. And incredibly, he did this even before we knew we needed it. That's how much he loves us. So as you think about the Father's example in Jesus and our need of him, let me give you some practical steps how to think through Jesus' words and apply them in day-to-day life. And let's think about the current lockdown COVID-19 situation. And I will use children currently going back to school as an example. But you can think of various situations you might be involved in and know of where this applies. All of life applies to this. Firstly, think other-centered. Because our tendency is to begin by thinking about ourselves, our children, or our income, or our safety, before we even think of others. You try and see it from the other person's perspective. Imagine you are the teacher receiving your children at school who has to prepare lessons online, then still have to do all the admin as well, they are functioning under tremendous stress and strain. So start thinking other-centeredly, as if you were them. Secondly, think of your father's example. 
Remember what he's done for you in Christ. His other-centered love towards you. He is a good father who always will do his best for his children. Look at the situation through your heavenly father's eyes, his perspective. Let his other-centeredness motivate you to be other-centered as well. But thirdly, pray to your father. Jesus just encouraged us to do it. Only he can help you see, understand, and respond in a way that brings joy to him and the other person you want to love. He alone can enable you to follow his example here. And you can trust him that if you ask him, if you seek him, if you knock on his door, he will answer in a way that is best. Even when it doesn't seem apparent to you at the time, trust him. He is good. Pray to him. Fourthly, ask yourself, before you do anything, ask yourself this question. What would I like someone to do for me if I was in my teacher's position? So would I like someone to rant on social media or gossiping about me, accusing me of not doing my job, judging me without really knowing me? Would I like someone to make unreasonable demands on my time and energy, forgetting that I too am a person with other responsibilities and relationships? Would I like someone questioning and bucking against every request I make to help their children? You know the answer, probably not. So ask yourself, what would I like someone to do for me if I were a teacher in this situation? If I were them, what would be good? Well, for starters, you can pray for them and tell them that you do. Also, a gentle word of appreciation and encouragement for what they're doing goes a long way in helping someone to persevere. You can be forgiving and gracious where you think your teachers might have slipped up, because you do too. And then fifthly, as you thought about this, go do it. As you reflected on the Father's love in Jesus, as you prayed to the Father to enable you to do this, as you thought through it by trying to think of what you would like someone to do for you if you were them, then go do it. Now you might stumble and you might fumble as you try and imitate your Heavenly Father, but this is a good place to start. But let me end with a different example of this other-centered love Jesus is calling us to and which we should pray to our Father to enable us to do. Now remember, we started talking about role models. We know our Heavenly Father is our perfect role model. His love demonstrated in Jesus is unmatchable. And we rely upon him to follow his example. Yet I can say this, I have seen glimmers of our Heavenly Father's example in many of his children. And let me tell you of one of them, Benjamin Warfield. Now today, some people might know him for being a great teacher at Princeton Seminary, but few might know about his private life, in particular his marriage. In 1876, Benjamin married Annie, and soon after their wedding they moved to Germany where he continued his studies in Leipzig. Now one of their joys during this time was to take long walks in the mountains in the region. Yet on one of these walks, they were caught in a fierce thunderstorm. No one to this day really knows what exactly happened, but Annie never recovered from the incident, and she became an invalid for the rest of her life. Now, Benjamin Warfield could have looked at the entire situation self-centeredly, thinking that the storm and Annie's illness robbed him of his own personal happiness. Furthermore, the father never answered the prayer to heal her in this life. He never did let this cup of suffering pass them. Instead, the father enabled Benjamin to act like Jesus in the situation. Trusting that his heavenly father knows what is best for him, Benjamin became Annie's caregiver until her death in 1915. Think about it. For 39 years... Benjamin faithfully and lovingly stayed by her side, caring for her as he vowed in sickness till death do us part. Two of his colleagues observing him wrote this. I used to see them walking together and the gentleness of his manner was just a striking proof 
of the loving care with which he surrounded her. Dr. Warfield used to read to her during certain definite hours every day. For many, many years, he has never been away from her more than two hours at a time. He did what his father did for him and Jesus. He remained faithful to his marriage covenant vows, caring and loving her as he would care and love himself. He gave his life to serve her. And the father answered his prayers by making Benjamin Warfield more like Jesus through the situation and giving us today a glimmer of what it looks like to follow verse 12, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So let's respond by doing what Jesus encouraged us to do in the first place. Pray to our Father to help us to follow him in this way. Father God, thank you for showing us your heart of love and sending your Son, Jesus, who showed us what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves, to do to others what we would like them to do to us, fully displayed at the cross. Forgive us where we doubted your goodness, where we relied upon ourselves and not upon your grace, that we did not respond to your invitation to ask and seek and knock. Father, we ask that you enable us to imitate your love revealed in Jesus. We seek to understand and be transformed by your goodness. We knock on your door for help. Please answer according to your own loving kindness to us. Give us what we need, not what we want. What you will, not what we will. We trust that you are good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father who in heaven reigns How great and mighty is your name Your kingdom come, your will be done Now here on earth as is above our daily bread and keep our hungry spirits fed may all our satisfaction be in you whose grace has set us free give us hope give us faith Help us trust in your guidance from the depths of your grace. You have richly provided. Thank you.
from the depths of your grace you have richly provided thank you Thank you for joining us this morning. It's always great to to be reminded of God's goodness to us in His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to say goodbye and close with these words from Ephesians chapter 3. To Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Have a great day. If you want to catch any of our previous Sunday streams, click this card and you'll be able to watch any one of them. Parents, remember our kids' videos that Caitlin told us about. You can click this playlist to catch all of those. If you haven't subscribed yet, consider subscribing to the channel and clicking the notifications bell. That way you won't miss anything new. Why don't you help us get to 500 subscribers? We're almost there. You might even be number 500. Have a great week.